Good day and welcome back to Chemistry Videos. My name is Clarissa Sorensen Unruh and I am going to talk about solutions today. Let's talk about solutions particularly in the context of colligative properties. Okay, so colligative properties. The important thing to recognize about colligative properties is really kind of a simple idea and that is that whatever the colligative property is, there are four main ones that we tend to talk about quite a lot, um, whether they're freezing point depression or vapor pressure lowering. In colligative properties, it actually doesn't matter what the identity of the solute is, it matters how much of it there is. Okay, so colligative properties are really their magnitude, okay, so the magnitude of the change, whatever that change is, right, whether it's a temperature or a pressure, is um, really affected most by the number of particles of the solute. Affected is affected most by number of particles of solute, not the identity of the solute. Okay. When we talk about change, this word change is really uh, where we get the idea of uh, talking about the solvent, right? So colligative properties are of solutions. Solutions have two components, a solute and a solvent. The solvent is incorporated within the change because when we measure colligative properties, it's always based off of the pure solvent as it is without any solute in it at all, okay? So for instance, there are, like I said, four basic colligative properties we tend to talk about. There's freezing point depression. My brain marker is getting a little squeaky. Boiling point elevation. Let's do a little moment here. Ooh. All right, there's vapor pressure lowering. Oh, look at that, a nice new marker. Gotta love a new marker. You know you're a teacher when <laughs> a new marker is really exciting. Vapor pressure lowering, and then there's also osmotic pressure, which I'll put over here. Am I going off the screen there? I am kind of going off the screen there. I'm sorry. How about if I do that? Ooh, suddenly we're back on the screen. Love that. Osmotic pressure. That C is as far as I can go, though. <laughs> right. Okay, so why did I do vapor pressure lowering and osmotic pressure in different colors than the freezing point depression and so on and so forth, even though you might not be able to tell the two different colors here. <laughs> okay. The reason why is because in freezing point depression and boiling point elevation, they have the same exact basic formula, right? The change in temperature, whatever that is, is going to be equal to some constant. That constant is different based off of what solvent you're using. It's, it's a constant that's associated with the solvent. And then times the molality times I, okay? All right, so what is all of this? Let's label it specifically for freezing point depression. All right, so we would have the delta TF is equal to KF times molality, and maybe I'll put the I over here so that it's a little bit easier to figure out. For boiling point elevation, it's the exact same deal. I times KB, right, it's a different different constant based off of boiling point as opposed to freezing point. 
Okay? The big difference between these two is when you take the change, what are you going to do with it? Well, that's where the word depression and elevation come in, right? So when we're going to talk about the change, we're either going to be subtracting it from the pure solvent as it exists without anything in it, whatever that freezing point is of the pure solvent, or we're going to be adding it to the pure solvent. So here it is. For the pure solvent's freezing point, the way we designate that is with this degree symbol. It's a freezing point depression, so I'm going to subtract out my change in temperature, and that'll give me the final temperature of the freezing point of the solution. That's what this sucker is right there. Okay? All right, so subtract out the change here, add in the change over here, right? So whatever your boiling point of your pure solvent is, you add in the change in boiling point. Okay? Oh, I'm a little bit. <laughs> Wow, I'm really existing. Wait, maybe I should go up a little bit. Maybe more? Oh, maybe a little bit. Oh, well, you can't really see it. All right. <laughs> I'm apparently all over the glass today in ways that you can't actually see. Let me rewrite this one more time so that you actually can see it. Here you go. What I wrote right here. We'll put a star right here. Star, star. That was this. Woo! And star, star, that's this. Sorry! Ooh, don't put a degree symbol there. Okay, so having said that, the degree symbol only symbolizes the pure version. Okay, having said all of that, okay, what are all, when I look at the general idea, Oh, I should do that up here. The general idea is right there, right? So I'm going to find the freezing point of the solution by subtracting out some change. I'm going to find the boiling point of the solution by adding in some change. The thing that we need to define further is what the change is, right? So in terms of this, we said M is molality. Let's do this in a different color. Perhaps pink. Molality. You should know what molality is because molality is a concentration value. It's the number of moles of solute solute over kilograms of solvent. Right? So that's what molality is. That's fabulous. Let's erase this a little bit so that it's not in my way now that we can't see it anyway. All right. And then when we're talking about what these other letters are, I told you that K, capital K, is a constant. It's a constant based off of whatever the solvent is. It changes for whether you're talking about the freezing point or the boiling, boiling point. Since a lot of the solutions we use are made with water as the solvent, one of the reasons why it's called the universal solvent, right? Then our Ks are pretty clear, right? So Kf for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius per molal, right? And then the Kb for water is 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. Okay, so those should be given. Those should be given on an exam. That's part of the deal of taking an exam. Okay, so in terms of uh, memorizing what the Ks are, you really don't need to. They change for different substances. You actually have to look them up on some kind of reference site. My favorite tends to be NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies. NIST has a web book which has kind of all of the major constants that you would need. It's fabulous. You just type in NIST web book into Google, Google, and that's the first thing you come up with. And it is very, very helpful. And it will, in fact, give you KF values at different uh, altitudes, <laughs> which is pretty cool. You got to be got to be careful sometimes. But indeed, the freezing point we know the freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius, and we know the boiling point of water 
is 100 degrees Celsius. Well, actually, it is, but it changes slightly at different altitudes. So when we're in Albuquerque, like we are, that might be a little different, right? We measured the freezing point depression in lab just the other day, and it ended up being about negative 0.2 degrees Celsius. So there you go. It's a little bit different. All right, so in terms of um, M, the little m, we know that the little m is molal. We know that K is a constant, so that should be given. The last piece, I. I is what we're missing, so let's talk about I. I is the Van Hoff factor. And I just erased the gloriousness of the definition that I had of colligative properties, where I said it didn't matter what the identity of the solute was, it just mattered how many particles it made. Well, that's true-ish, right? But the problem is, is of course, that we know that ionic solids, when you put them into water, form more than one particle. So it does matter just a little bit on the identity, just because it makes more particles. Okay, so Van Hoff the Van Hoff factor accounts for ionic solids, particularly in an aqueous solution. The Van Hoff factor is almost always predicted. Okay, so if I wanted to find the Van Hoff factor for something like, um, let's think of something that doesn't really break apart in water. Let's do. Um, Maybe some vinegar. We know it slightly breaks apart, but acetic acid. You'll work with me just a little bit. We're gonna assume it doesn't, right? <laughs> just a little bit. That's actually as acetate. Acetic acid does break apart just a little bit in water. Maybe that's a bad e example. Oh well, we're just gonna work with it anyway. Let's do, well, let's do something else. Let's do maybe something that breaks apart in water a little less. Let's do sucrose or glucose. Let's do glucose. Glucose is not perfect, but it's not quite as bad as acetic acid. Because <laughs> acetic acid really should break apart in water. All right, here we go. Um, let's do glucose, C6H12O6. And water, we're going to assume relatively speaking it doesn't break apart very much okay but we know that NaCl is made up of two ions when you put that in water in a water environment then it forms Na pluses and Cl minuses that's two particles so the Van Hoff factor here we would expect to be two if we had something else that was highly soluble like K2SO4 we would expect that to break apart in water as well Okay, so we predict Van Hoff factors if when we actually measure them, they're usually a little bit less than what we predicted. And that's just due to experimental error. That's the way that goes, right? So NaCl, the measured value can be anywhere from like 1.6 to 1.9. It's not quite two, but it's close. Okay, so in terms of looking at that, that's what the Van Hoff factor is. You would put in, if you have an ionic solid in water, you would put in that you're going to double the amount or triple the amount of the effect based off of the fact that it makes not one particle, but two or three or four or whatever. Okay, so having said that, that's boiling point elevation. In terms of the other stuff, freezing point, uh, wait, sorry, that was boiling point elevation and freezing point depression. It was both of those. We're done. Okay, in terms of vapor pressure lowering, we should talk about that. And notice that I am putting I's in. Your book often separates it in terms of talking about when I needs to be considered versus when it doesn't. So it'll talk about non-electrolytes versus electrolytes. If we talk about um, non-electrolytes versus electrolytes, non-electrolytes are basically like the glucose here. They don't dissolve in water, okay? Or they don't dissolve in the solute. I mean, the solvent that you're using, right? So the solute does not dissolve into multiple particles in the solvent that you're using, okay? But in the case of electrolytes, electrolytes are really based off of whether 
you have an ionic solid and it happens to be in water and it, then it conducts electricity. We talk about that in intro chem, but electrolytes are basically talking about these ionic solids, right? So these are electrolytes according to your book, and they are indeed electrolytes, and these are non-electrolytes. So non-electrolytes, the Van Hoff factor is always considered, but it happens to be one, so you don't have to worry about it in the context of the equation. Electrolytes, I is not one, so you have to worry about it in the context of the equation. You'll always see me incorporate I into the formula. That's just what I do. Because even if it's one, it's one, you just don't have to worry about it, but it should still be in the formula. All right, vapor pressure lowering. We already know that by the lowering, it's just like the freezing point depression was, whatever the original pressure was, right? The original pressure of the solvent in its pure form, whatever that is, we're going to have to subtract out a change based off of the solution because it's a lowering. And that's how I'm going to get the pressure of the solution. Okay? That's absolutely true. Okay, this is the idea of the basis of va vapor pressure lowering. If you want to incorporate I, you would use this change in P, right? And the change in P is equal to I times the, um, really it's very specific here. So I times the chi of the solute times the pressure of the solvent in its pure form. All right, that's kind of interesting. So what does all of this mean? Okay, let's erase electrolytes here so that it doesn't get confusing as to what we're talking about. Right? Well, we know what I is now. I is the Van Hoff factor. That's what we're talking about in terms of thinking about if you have electrolytes versus non-electrolytes or ionic solids versus non-ionic solids. Right? So that's one of the pieces we're thinking about. The pressure of the solvent in its pure form makes sense because a vapor pressure is based off of this idea of boiling and condensation. It's vapor pressure is actually in Gen Chem 1, one of our introductions to this idea of equilibrium. So let's talk about vapor pressure for just a minute. Vapor pressure when you talk about it, is basically the idea that if you had, let's say we had a teapot. That is a horrible teapot, but you're going to forgive me for that. It's kind of how my, boil my pot looks in my house. Woo, there you go. Okay. You put water in the teapot, right? And you boil it. So there's my flame. Woo, I should have made that in blue, but that's okay. Okay, so I have a gas stove, life is lost, awesome. Here's my water. And what happens inside the teapot is that water goes from being a liquid to being a gas. That makes sense, it boils, right? That's what boiling is. Okay, so it goes from being a liquid to being a gas. And at the same time, eventually, as you heat it, continue to heat it, it will go from being a gas and it will condense back into being a liquid. Okay? That's a really interesting piece, right? So this idea of vapor pressure is actually based off of an equilibrium, and an equilibrium means that the rate of the process in one direction is exactly equal to the rate of the process in the opposite direction. So in this case, my process would be the rate of water going from the liquid to the gas would be exactly the same rate as water going from the gas to the liquid, okay? Vapor pressure is when this equilibrium matches the outside pressure, whatever that is, okay? So in terms of looking at this particular moment, right, vapor pressure can exist within this specific moment, okay, so the vapor pressure, actually I, I said that a bit wrong. Vapor pressure is really the equilibrium. It's really the rate of the liquid going to the gas is the same as the gas going to the liquid. 
that's vapor pressure. What happens with the boiling point is when it's equal to the outside, um, the outside pressure, right? So at the point when the outside pressure, which could be about one atm, comes in, and this vapor pressure equals that outside pressure, then we call that point the normal boiling point. Kind of fascinating, isn't it? I know, crazy. Okay, so in this case, we're looking for the vapor pressure. The vapor pressure talking about that equilibrium, right? So when we talk about vapor pressure lowering, basically the idea here is that the pure solvent does this and it has a specific value. That would be what that pressure of the pure solvent is. When you add a solute to it, then suddenly you've crowded up the liquid piece, right? So you have little particles here. And basically that the liquid still is the part that's going into the gas phase and then condensing back down. But if you have particles in there, my little crappy particles being some of them that you can see here, those particles are going to keep the liquid from being able to get into the gas phase as easily. Okay, and when it keeps it from getting into the gas phase as easily, then the entire thing drops. If I can't get into the gas phase as easily, then the gas phase can't get into the, lo into the liquid phase as easily, and the vapor pressure lowers. Okay, awesome. So, in terms of this, I need the chi of the solute. What is chi of solute? Remember, chi is a way that we talked about the mole fraction in the gas chapter. So this would be the moles of the solute over the moles of the solution. Again, a concentration value that you should already know. Okay, So that's one way to talk about vapor pressure lowering. That's the way that incorporates the ability to do an electrolyte. Okay, There's also another way to do vapor pressure lowering. It's a little bit cr quicker. It's call, called Routes Law. And Routes Law only works for non-electrolytes. So you got to be a little bit careful here, right? Non-electrolytes is the way you can go with Routes Law. And what you get is you basically get the pressure of the solution, the final value that you're getting here, a little bit easier. Because all that you do here is you use the chi of the solvent times the original pressure of the solvent. Right? Notice difference. Chi of the solvent is not chi of the solute. Chi of the solvent would just be the mole fraction for the solvent. Right? Moles of solvent over moles of solution. Okay? So just FYI. In terms of the last one, osmotic pressure. Okay, so a brief moment on vapor pressure there. Realize Routes Law only works with non-electrolytes non way faster than doing two pieces, but you have to have a non-electrolyte for it to work. The last piece, of course, is osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is based off of the idea of the ideal gas law, actually. So if you had the ideal gas law and you relabeled basically the pressure component as osmotic pressure, okay? At least the formula is based off of the ideal gas law, not the actual concept, okay? Osmotic pressure is actually based off of this idea of um, a concentration gradient, right? So you have this idea of uh, when we talk about osmosis, we want uh, particles or we want solute to go not necessarily solute, I shouldn't say it that way, solvent to go from higher concentration to lower concentration. That's the idea. Okay, so that's what you're tracking when you're doing osmotic pressure. It's based off of the ideal gas law, like I said. PV equals NRT. We'll talk a little bit more about osmotic pressure some other, in some other video. If I relabeled P as the osmotic, osmotic pressure constant, and all that the other piece is, is that we combine N and V together, okay? So if I redid re this in such a way that I had, I solved for P, 
If I solve for p, then I would have this. If I combined n and v together, then that's actually moles per liter, which is the, another way of saying molarity, right? Molarity is moles per liter, OK? So if I inserted that in, then I would get, and I relabeled p as uh, capital pi, then I get MRT. RT is the same, M is there, and I can just stick a Van Hoff factor right in front of that. Okay. Calculating osmotic pressure, probably one of the more important pieces um, if you're going to go on to biology. Um, certainly something to think about. We'll talk about what that means a little bit more in our future. Until next time, adieu.